So, um, hello and good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar and thanks for joining us. My name's Linda. I acknowledge I'm hosting tonight's webinar on the land of the Gadigal people who are part of the Eora Nation. I also acknowledge the traditional custodians of the various lands you are on. We pay our respects to the first inhabitants of this nation and the traditional custodians of the lands on which we live, learn and work. We recognize their continuing connection to land, water and sky and pay our respects to elders past, present and emerging. Their lands have never been ceded. Um, so as I mentioned, um, I've already mentioned about the chat box and um, sadly, since our last public meeting, we've lost two incredible animal activists, Christina Corrales and Siobhan O'Sullivan. Christina Corrales um, packed up everything and sold everything and about uh, 13 or 14 years ago, uh, she went to live in Peru, to live very humbly um, in a hut, the hammock, uh, and she established her Peru street dog sanctuary. She was killed along with one of her dogs while she was out walking in the jungle. She was also Jessica Bailey's mum, Jess, of course, being the creator of the cruelty fee festivals and a pioneer in the vegan movement, having at one time had four vegan supermarkets. Christina was as humble as her heart was big. Her material possessions consisted of a pair of flip-flops, a couple of t-shirts and some shorts. Every cent Christina had went to vet bills and nurturing dogs she res rescued from terrible lives and she loved them to good health. Um, and currently homes are now being found for all those dogs. Animal philosopher and activist Siobhan O'Sullivan recently lost her long struggle against ovarian cancer. We deeply regret her untimely death at the age of 49 after having done so much to make the world a better place for all sentient beings. Siobhan was a remarkable individual and scholar who dedicated her work to advocating for animals, both inside and outside academia. Siobhan was one of the authors who triggered the political turn in animal philosophy, focusing on the political implications of the moral consideration of animals she started working on this field very early in her career. In 2007, her PhD thesis was one of the first on the consideration of non-human animals in politics and was the basis for her book, Animals, Equality and Democracy. In addition, Siobhan was the author of around 100 other academic publications, including the compilation, The Political Turn in Animal Ethics. And Siobhan was also a director of Animal Liberation some 18 years ago. Losing both of these amazing people are losses to the world. Um, tonight, I am so pleased that our first guest and speaker is Tara Wood. She's the co-founder and volunteer principal solicitor for the Animal Defenders Office, a nationally accredited volunteer-run community legal centre based in Canberra. Tara has also taught animal law at the University of New South Wales since 2008 and is an animal welfare representative on a university's animal ethics committee. And this from Mike and Neiman of KNR Animal Law who are no slouches in the hardworking department. A huge congratulations to Tara Ward, the Executive Director of the Animal Defenders Office, for being awarded the RSPCA's 2019 Sybil Elmsley Animal Law Scholarship. There is no harder working animal lawyer and possibly lawyer than Tara, and we think the scholarship is overwhelmingly deserved. And in 2020, Tara was awarded the not-for-profit lawyer of the year. 
And I do truly believe she has somehow found a way to function on three hours sleep because she never, ever stops. Thank you for joining us tonight, Tara. Gosh, thank you so much, Linda. And um, clearly I live under a rock because I hadn't heard of the two um, people um, who we've just lost. So that was um, an awful shock. So uh, it's a bit hard to follow Sorry. up <laughs> after that. So, um, yeah, that's that's. thank you for expressing those condolences. Oh, those heartfelt condolences where very much the poorer are uh, the animal community without those two um, amazing women. So um, without further ado, um, and sorry, I've got no segue from, from that to, to my talk, but um, thank you so much for having me. I will now again try to share my screen. <clears throat> Is that okay? Can you see the ones? Oh, yeah, great. Hopefully yeah, everyone can see that. <clears throat> great. Thank you so much. Look. Um, I don't want to prolong the the the, the pain, but um, <laughs> I just always put up a little bit about myself for those who don't know me. Um, I've yet, yeah, um, you know, I'm very um, uh, proud to be part of the animal protection movement uh, here in Australia, um, and yeah, have been in it for quite a little while now. And um, yeah, um, full strength to all of us. Uh, there's a lot to accomplish, as we all know. Um, so thank you for inviting me to present to you this evening. And I'm just going to get rid of that. <clears throat> uh, and uh, yes, but let's get on to uh, important matters, of course. And again, I'd like to um, uh, echo Linda's um, heartfelt acknowledgement. And uh, I'll, I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of country from um, where I'm coming to you uh, tonight, which is Ngunnawal and the Gambri country. Uh, and I acknowledge uh, the traditional owners and traditional owners throughout Australia and their continuing connection to land, sea, animals and community. And I especially want to pay my respects to their elders, seeing as we've just had NAIDOC week and its theme for our elders and all of our lives are enriched by elders so a big shout, shout out to all the elders out there <laughs> um <clears throat> I'm just thinking maybe I'm one of those two I'm at that age but anyway um so I also want to acknowledge that when we talk about animals uh <clears throat> you know the question is who are we talking about we have this one word animal and yet uh, it captures so many different creatures. So as we know, uh, the postmodern French philosopher Derrida looked at the whole so-called human-animal dichotomy. And as a philosophical issue, I know we're supposed to be talking about the law, but um, just, just, uh, we'll just reflect on this for a moment. Um, as a philosophical issue, he asked if it was right that we corral, and he used the French equivalent of that term, um, you know, uh, it's, it's such an appropriate term because, of course, as we know, it means corralling farmed animal, animals, rounding them up, caging them, etc. cetera. Um, so we use that word to corral all these different creatures into one antithetical other which both the law and society in general refers to as animal animals. So thinking in binarisms is a process of construction that involves one, one element being valued and the other oppressed. And such binarisms involve um, conceptual subordination and violence. And in the case of non-human animals, of course, leads to real violence as we know all too well. And what we can see here in the image uh, are only the land-based vertebrates. As we know, vertebrates are what, I think it's something like less than 10% of the animals on earth, uh, whereas invertebrates, of course, are therefore more than 90%. And of course, because my part of tonight's webinar will focus on the law, we've also got to consider what the law is talking about when it refers to animal or animals. And this is where it gets really surreal. Because um, as lawyers, we always start with the legal definition of terms. So here's a typical definition of, of the term animal from two New South Wales laws. And you can see uh, that they define animals, meaning a vertebrate animal, uh, including mammal, bird, etc., but does not include a human being. So we can already see some important um, 
themes, animal law themes from the definition, i.e. it only um, includes vertebrates. Their vertebrates are conventionally uh, included in the legal definition of animal. Um, so our interaction with any other kind of animal is unregulated. And the other big theme is that the definition of animal um, doesn't include human beings, which of course is a massive legal fiction. Um, anyway, getting back to the theme of my talk, the ADO and what we do. So we are all volunteers. It's 100% volunteer based. Um, so we're lawyers, interns, um, practical legal training, uh, graduates, work experience. We have a tiny one room, that is literally it, uh, office based in Canberra. Uh, we're not government funded. We don't receive any ongoing government funding. And that presents a lot of challenges because it means we can't employ any solicitors. Uh, so we're dependent on people helping out in their free time or experts providing for, uh, pro bono assistance. But sort of the flip side is that we're completely independent. So we can choose exactly what we want to work on and who we want to help, which is a good silver lining because it means that uh, we can help animal activists and advocates in a whole range of different circumstances. So despite focusing on animals and animal law, we are a community legal centre, nationally accredited, providing free legal services. And of course, most of our clients are people and especially are animal activists and advocates. So they're our main client base in our representation caseload. And that can involve a wide range of practice areas such as trespass, public assembly laws, sentencing hearings and appeals, um, et cetera, just sort of a um, few examples. And we also help, of course, organisations providing legal assistance to animal protection associations and charities, and even some political parties, large and small. But back to representing people and especially animal advocates, let's go to some cases, which is what I wanted to focus on tonight. So probably our biggest case, and I'll, I'll try and fit in three case studies if I can, so I'll, I'll get a move on. Uh, probably our biggest case so far in terms of time and sort of, you know, the sort of court hierarchy uh, would be this one here. So the Lakesland 13, you probably all know it. Um, you probably, some of you may have lived through it because it did go on for a long time. But for those who don't, I'll just give a very quick overview. It involved uh, several, um, 13 to be exact, individuals who uh, jumped a fence to help thousands of dying layer hens left to starve in a barn on private land in rural New South Wales. The RSPCA had inspected the premises and agreed the hens were suffering, but they had decided to leave them uh, in situ under the so-called care, care of the farmer who owned them. But he, of course, was the very person who was responsible for starving and neglecting the hens to the point where at least a thousand uh, of the poor creatures had already died. The farmer was much later after these events are uh, convicted of several cruelty offences. So we are talking real animal cruelty here. But in the immediate term, the decision by the RSPCA officers to walk away and leave the hens where they were without any veterinary treatment or any other kind of attention meant that thousands of hens continued in that immediate term to suffer and obviously feel pain. So the rescuers attempted to do something about this. However, they were stopped and arrested by police and charged with various offences, including aggravated trespass, not just trespass, but that it's trespass involving actual or intended interference with the conduct of a business. Now, one of the 13 was a minor, so um, they went down a different pathway. But of the remaining 12, the, uh, the ADO represented um, about two thirds, I think, uh, several of whom pleaded not guilty to the various charges. And that resulted in a lengthy defended hearing. So we and we are the ADO as the solicitors were instructing the wonderful barrister Peter Singleton, who appeared for our clients in the trial on a pro bono basis. And the trial ended up going for 10 days in total. So that was no mean feat representing um, on a pro bono basis for a, a 10 day trial. Um, 
Now, at issue was that our clients were pleading not guilty on the basis of the criminal defence of necessity. Now, this defence is available as a defence to a minor criminal act if done to prevent a greater harm and in an emergency when there's no other course of action. So the law in very limited circumstances will allow an unlawful act to occur, but in order to stop a much greater harm. The question is, a greater harm to whom? Does it have to be the person committing the minor criminal act, i.e. The, in, you know, if it goes to trial, the defendant, or another person? And the legal issue before the court in this case was, is the defence of necessity available to a person seeking to stop a significant harm to animals, i.e., um, is it ultimately acceptable to commit a small wrongdoing in order to avoid a much greater harm in this case? So in this case, small wrongdoing, hopping over a fence into private land, but to prevent the intense suffering of thousands of sentient animals. So ultimately, the local court found the rescuers were guilty of aggravated trespass. In other words, the court rejected the defence of necessity. The court found that on the facts, there was no situation of imminent peril. So obviously, our clients uh, found this difficult to accept. I think any reasonable, rational person would, having seen and tried to help the desperately ill and dying hens at the site. So a slightly smaller group of the rescuers appealed the decision straight to the Supreme Court so we were able to bypass the district court because we were appealing on a matter of law. That is, is the defence of necessity available to rescuers of animals? Will the law allow committing a small wrongdoing in order to avoid a much greater harm? In, in other words, a suffering of thousands of sentient animals. Now, the rescuers' arguments included in the Supreme Court appeal that their response was proportionate, which is one of the elements of the defence, to the danger facing the harms. In other words, that uh, there was no alternative response to the threatened harm other than to engage in the wrongful conduct. It was the only option to stop the suffering of the hens. However, the Supreme Court rejected that as a, and, and uh, on the basis that as a matter of obje uh, objective fact, um, so it rejected the idea that as a matter of objective fact, there was no alternative response to the threatened harm other than to engage in the wrongful conduct. And the Supreme Court uh, dismissed the uh, rescuer's appeal. So what do determined animal advocates do who want to try to improve the law in a way um, uh, to, that it protect, better protects animals and their defenders. We appealed again. Well, we, we filed um, in the Court of Appeal, uh, we sought leave to appeal. Uh, so there's no automatic right of appeal. You have to seek the court's leave to appeal. And by this time, we were down to one rescuer on whose behalf we filed the leave to appeal in the New South Wales Court of Appeal. The matter was heard in uh, July 2021 before three judges of the highest court in New South Wales. The court handed down its decision in December 2021 and unfortunately was emphatically dismissed by all three judges, whose reasons included that the authorities do not support the defence as extending to conduct undertaken to avoid threatened harm to animals. They also said that the defence exists only where the circumstances are such as to overwhelmingly impel disobedience to the law. And of course, by implication, this could never be to rescue animals. <clears throat> so extremely disappointing, um, but one learning from this matter. So yeah, what can we take from that? Um, uh, you know, one thing is that if you see a dog drowning in a pool, for example, in someone's backyard, or um, uh, you might see a neglected and tethered dog in a backyard, say of neighbours you don't get on with, think twice, think very carefully before you hop the fence to rescue the animal. 
So I just want to end this first case study by thanking the defendants in this matter, especially those who went to the Supreme Court and then the, the last one standing, uh, Issy, who went on to the Court of Appeal. Their courage and commitment to animal protection was incredible. And of course, our barrister, Peter Singleton, whose dedication to this matter and brilliance um, is unparalleled. And uh, it was just such a pity that let's just say that we were ahead of our time. A different court in a different time could have had a completely different result. And one that recognised that animals are sentient and can be um, in urgent need of rescue as well. So very quickly, um, our second case study, because I can't see a clock here, but uh, um, maybe that's just as well. Uh, so this one involves the animal advocate, David Raddons, and the A Thousand Eyes or Cube of Truth or Dominion, Dominion style of action that has become popular or a popular if controversial form of advocacy in recent years. So as you probably all may know, David was taking part in one of these types of actions at dusk on a Sunday in early January, 2020 in Cairns. And he had set himself up to one side of a big open square in the city. I've never been to Cairns, but it's known as the Esplanade. He was playing the usual style of footage showing animals being used in various industries. The sound was muted and it was still daylight being in the middle of a hot um, Australian summer. So visibility of the footage on the screen would have been quite poor. But after only about 40 minutes, he was approached by police officers who had been alerted to his protest by a security personnel monitoring CCTV footage of the area. There'd been no complaints from members of the public. But despite this, the police officers asked David to turn off his screen because in the officer's opinion, the footage he was showing was offensive to passers-by. Um, that's kind of the idea. But they said, especially children. Now, David refused, citing his right to freedom of expression under the state's new human rights laws, but he was then arrested and charged with committing a public nuisance offence under Queensland's Summary Offences Act. And, and that act states that a person commits a public nuisance offence if the person behaves in an offensive way and the behaviour interferes with the uh, peaceful passage through or enjoyment of a public place by a member of the public. Now, David pleaded not guilty in the Cairns Magistrates Court and due to COVID, the case dragged on for quite a while, um, making headlines in that reputable publication, the Cairns Post. The benefit was that due to COVID, we, the ADO here in Canberra, could appear for David in, in various of the sort of you know, minor hearings as it was all done by AVL. David represented himself in person, though, at the hearing, at the main sort of defended hearing, uh, but he uh, relied on or used submissions that we'd help uh, draft for him. The court finally handed down uh, its decision and found David guilty of being a public nuisance for showing footage of animals in agricultural facilities. No conviction was recorded, but he was fined $400. Uh, Sorry, uh, lost the screen there. So I just wanted to say that this small magistrate's case uh, is significant for several reasons, of course. I mean, it raises the question that if footage of routine animal husbandry practices is too offensive to be shown in public, what does that say about the practices themselves? The footage he was showing, of course, was standard industry practices at Australian animal slaughterhouses and other animal use facilities. So much, if not all, of the conduct shown in the footage would therefore not be not be in breach of animal welfare laws. So the footage he was um, uh, David was um, held to be a public nuisance on the grounds of offensive behaviour was depicting legal animal husbandry and other practices. So in other words, we now have had a court of the land find that the treatment of animals in Australian slaughterhouses and other animal facilities is too offensive to be shown in public. So, of course, the case also is a damning indictment of our so-called animal welfare laws that allow practices that, again, are too offensive to be shown in public. 
but also uh, just very quickly, the court case occurred, um, or the events that led up to it occurred only days after Queensland human rights laws commenced. And these laws especially expressly protect the freedom of expression and the right of peaceful assembly that we all as advocates, um, you know, really value. The new laws explicitly protect fundamental individual human rights for the first time um, in, in the state's history. Uh, they, they were literally days old. And of course, they exist alongside the implied freedom of political communication that the High Court of Australia has recognised in the Australian Constitution and which can invalidate laws that infringe um, the implied freedom. So David's case therefore seemed to pit the freedom of political communication against the implied right of the public not to be subjected to allegedly offensive behaviour. And in this case, the latter um, prevailed. <clears throat> uh, and uh, in addition to what the case may say about the strength of the implied and expressed freedoms of political expression in Australia, the case serves as an indication of the kind of legal barriers that animal advocates are increasingly facing in Australia and around the world. So at the ADO, we found this outcome so galling that we wanted to bring the case to the attention of the legal profession and political theorists here and internationally. So we pitched an article to the ACT Law Society and they agreed to publish it in their very respected journal that goes to judges and lawyers, et cetera. So we ensured that the decision was publicized in mainstream legal circles. We also presented a paper on it to an international conference on political theory. And finally, I really must look at a book, find it the time somewhere, but uh, look, just yell out, oh, it's 6.58. Uh, hopefully that means I'm still in time. Uh, this is the third case study, third and final, I, I hasten to reassure. Uh, I wanted to talk about this one just because it's ongoing, um, but it's also about defamation, so a civil matter, so out of the criminal realm into the civil matter. And, and how it's being used to gag animal advocates. Um, so I'll talk very generally and quickly about a matter that we're currently involved in. And so this case is still before the courts and still in its preliminary, preliminary stages, despite having been commenced over a year and a half ago. So I can only talk about what is on the public record. Um, so early last year, uh, we were contacted by a member of the public in Victoria who was being sued for defamation by a dog breeder. The events uh, that led up to the, the case uh, um, started back in 2020 uh, when the dog breeder in Victoria, the dog breeder was also in Victoria and, and put in an application to the local council under planning laws. And the dog breeder lived in a farming zone in rural Victoria and wanted to amend the dog breeder's planning permit to increase the number of dogs kept on the property, the dog breeding property, from 100 uh, to uh, approximately 145, including 40 breeding female dogs. So remember, this is Victoria, the state that probably has the tightest rules on intensive dog breeding, yet this is still perfectly legal. So the council released the dog breeder's proposal for public consultation and both individuals and organisations made submissions on it. Many of them, understandably, objecting to the planned increase in breeding dogs. And uh, part of those who objected included a member of the public who lived near the dog breeder who had submitted their objections to council and who had made a few social media posts encouraging others to do the same and objecting to the proliferation of puppy farms in the area. The individual did take the post um, down around the time the breeder withdrew uh, their application from council. But about a year later, this person found themselves receiving threatening letters from the dog breeder's lawyers claiming the breeder had been defamed on the grounds that they had been called a puppy farmer in the person's posts. Threats turned to reality and the breeder then in the New South Wales um, uh, or um, uh, in the New South Wales District Court, uh, sorry, I missed something there, commenced proceedings basically, um, uh, lodged his statement of claim in the New South Wales District Court in late 2021. So this forced the member of the public to engage lawyers um, at, at, at um, paying at rates um, or fees. 
However, by about March 2022, the member of public, now of course being the defendant in the matter before the court, had completely run out of money, although the matter had barely begun. That's how expensive these matters are. Uh, it was still only in its preliminary stages. So that's when the um, advocate approached the ADO. So we in turn reached out for pro bono assistance, I hasten to add, we in turn reached out to the New South Wales Bar Association for a pro bono barrister, because apart from defamation being a hugely complex area of the law, there was a directions hearing coming up fast. So we had to find some expert representation on representation. Now, fortunately for us and the defendant, the wonderful Parisa Hart, our barrister, and now at um, Nigel Bowen, uh, Bowen Chambers, agreed to take it on, the matter on, on a no win, no fee basis. So Parisa uh, promptly won an application to have the matter stayed in the New South Wales District Court as an inappropriate forum, given that everything about the case was in Victoria. So we hoped that that would be the end of the matter as both parties were sort of really um, hemorrhaging costs, um, including of course, um, our concern, our client who was having to pay, uh, who did end up having to pay because the court considered that they had delayed the matter in the early months, which was before we came on board. And also with various other costs assessments uh, however, the dog breeder um, has now got a new legal team based in Victoria and is going full steam ahead to have the matter transferred to Victoria, where it will go to trial and could go for five to 10 days with barristers and witnesses, etc. So it could turn out to be an extremely stressful and expensive um, uh, undertaking. So in a sense, it's going to start all over again in the Victorian County Court, and it is a really serious matter. So it turns out that this is not the first time the legal team for the other party in the matter we're involved in has represented a dog breeder in a defamation case in Victoria. It turns out that they were the legal team that successfully represented another dog breeder in Victoria who sued an advocate for speaking out against the dog breeder calling them a puppy farmer and calling into question um, their animal welfare record. So a quick summary of the facts for those who haven't come across this case. Uh, it happened over about two months in 2020 when a member of the public published a number of posts on the reviews page of a breeder of French Bulldogs um, based in Victoria, their Facebook page, I think. They included statements like, you are a puppy farmer on a mass scale, I have been there, I'm quoting from the judgment. There were several other posts and statements, but all of a similar nature. The online discussions, if we can call them that, seem to have started about the condition of a puppy allegedly purchased from the breeder business, and the discussions went downhill from there. So the breeder and their small company, now remember, if a business is small enough, it, can, it too can sue for defamation. So the breeder and the small company, uh, small breeding company, did sue for defamation on the grounds that, to oversimplify, it was defamatory to be called a puppy farmer. Ultimately, uh, the Victorian County Court found that the imputations, i.e. the assertions that the plaintiffs were puppy farmers, were defamatory of them and relied at least in part on the RSPCA's definition of puppy farming. Puppy farming isn't a term that's defined in legislation, but the court in this case relied on the RSPCA's defamation to reach its view that to be called a puppy farmer is defamatory or can be defamatory. <clears throat> they accepted that those terms are derogatory in the community. And uh, the court didn't consider that any of these assertions were trivial. And uh, the court found that the posts were published recklessly and without making any proper um, investigations. So the person making the post didn't make any proper investigations. The court rejected the usual defences of truth, qualified privilege, in other words, where it's your legal, social or moral duty to speak out, and honest opinion. 
It just wasn't satisfied that the defendant could establish that any of the allegations were true or even substantially true. And the court awarded damages of $100,000 plus aggravated damages of 15000 and interest of over 5000 so all up over um, 120000 So really quickly as I wrap up my talk, I thought I'd highlight some of the important lessons from this case, especially for um, advocates. So as we all know, um, it's good to remind, uh, we all know of them, I'm sure, um, but it's good to remind ourselves of them. So to start with, uh, my first um, recommendation would be um, quite simply just get off social media. Uh, but seriously, if that's if that's not an option, and I know for many of us it isn't, um, at least don't vent on it. But if you must vent, you might want to consider some of the things that led to the decision um, against the defendant in this case. So if you're relying on your own or someone else witnessing something uh, about what you're commenting on, make sure it's recent. So in this case, various witnesses for the breeder gave contemporary evidence, i.e. at the time of the posts, about the breeding dogs and the conditions of the puppies. And the court accepted those. By contrast, the defendant had, had been to the property on a few occasions, but several years earlier. Make it really clear if your posts are your opinions. The court in this case said that, that the, quote, posts fail to make it clear whether comments in them were factual or, apparent or opinions. <clears throat> also, if making allegations about the conditions animals are living in or of the animals themselves, make sure you have good expert opinion to back it up and all your claims are based on proper material, in other words, recent photographs. And a final sort of thing, consider taking down the post as soon as you think they've served their purpose. Purpose, sorry. So I'll end just by noting why it's so important to, be, to avoid, <laughs> if anyone is in any doubt, um, why it's so important to avoid being sued for defamation. Because from my experience involved in the case that we're um, currently involved in and what I've observed in this case, it has been a truly awful experience for so many reasons. It's been incredibly long and drawn out. Um, as I say, it's been going on for this long and it's still only at the preliminary stages. So it really is like a sort of Damocles hanging over um, the defendant for a long time, which of course um, is extremely stressful. And contributing to the stress is how costly it is. Even if you ultimately win or settle, so many little things along the way cost, and these costs really add up. Um, and of course, the costs skyrocket if you're paying your own um, legal team. And don't think that the social justice angle or being on the right side of a moral debate means that you're going to emerge triumphant. This is defamation. It's a whole different world with its own rules and tests, et cetera, and complexities. So even if ultimately, again, you end up winning, um, you can still end up paying the plaintiff, be it a breeder or any other animal user, a lot of money in costs along the way. And none of us want to be doing that if we can avoid it. And finally, the way animal users are using defamation means it is like a form of ag gag law in that it can have the effect of shutting down criticism and opposing views. So we just have to be smart about the way we go about expressing our views, um, especially on social media. So I am going to end now on a just one one happy slide, um, completely different, happy note. We've been having the, at the ADO having a lot of, or some success recently in tribunal matters about impounded dogs, getting them released, uh, where we represent keepers challenging government impound decisions. So it's not particularly relevant to uh, advocates, unless you have a mis mischievous pet who gets into trouble. But I just wanted to end on that uh, positive note. So sorry for going over time, but thank you. And um, uh, as a lawyer, I do just have to say that nothing I've said tonight um, should be taken as oh. legal advice. Um, see a lawyer <laughs> if you need advice. <laughs> but thank you so much for having me and I'll, I'll Tara, stop sharing. Oh. <laughs> Sorry that that went off so Sarah, long. Sarah, <laughs> you just, I've learned so much from you. And truly, I we can have a webinar with just you. I mean, you've 
I just learned so much and I'm so grateful to you. And on behalf of all the humans and animals that you, you help, thank you. Deepest oh. thanks. Um, thank you. Thanks very and, much uh, for may, me. Maybe I know you, you work 22 out of 24 hours a day. <laughs> if you can squeeze us in again to give us an update about the... Um, the, the case that's been now moved to Victoria. I'm sure we'd all love to, to hear about that. I'm sure it'll be around for a while. Um, well, I'm not sure, but it may be. <laughs> Let's hope it isn't. <laughs> uh, fingers crossed. Um, yeah. But, yes, thank you so much for having me and all the best for the rest of the um, uh, webinar. And I look forward to um, watching uh, the recording. But, uh, but I will have to run since I myself have kept myself late. Yep. So um, thank you so much. And I'll just say goodbye to everyone thank you